we are going to talk about all things muzzles tonight. This is a big topic and I'm not going to be able to cover everything because that would take many, many hours, but we're going to try and go through a whole bunch of different stuff. So for those of you that I haven't met before, I'm Miranda Hitchcock. I'm the one of the founders and the executive director for Every Dog Behavior and Training here in Austin. Um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit that is dedicated to making it so that everyone in our community has access to dog training and behavior resources. So I come from an animal sheltering background. I worked in several animal shelters before I left to start this nonprofit. And now we work with all kinds of different dogs in many different scenarios, um, largely through behavior consulting. So lots of fun muzzle experience, lots of stuff for us to talk about. I do also have a master's in applied animal behavior. Um, it is very fun, um, lots of fun stuff to talk about dog training and behavior related. But today we are really going to focus on muzzles and everything you need to know about them. So tonight's plan, we're going to talk about why we muzzle. We're going to talk about types of muzzles out there, things that we should be looking for as we compare different muzzle options. Some of the common brands, I'm not gonna go through everything, but I'll go through some of the common ones. Um, fitting a muzzle, cause this is, oh boy, a big topic. Um, examples of good or poor fit in muzzles. We're gonna talk about the training process for how we get our dogs to wear a muzzle. So a little bit about the stigma of muzzling and what we can do about it. And then troubleshooting some common things. Um, this is my dog, Nina, and uh, her muzzle. Um, she is asleep behind me, but there is a chance that at some point tonight she may scream because she thinks the Amazon truck is coming by. Um, she loves to bark at it. So just bear with me if that happens. Um, but otherwise, we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, if you have questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat. Depending on what it is, I may hold it for the end or answer it as we go. All right, let's get started. So why do we muzzle our dogs? There are a whole bunch of reasons why we might choose to use a muzzle. The most common is because we wanna prevent our dog from biting something. Um, that could be a dog who struggles with new people. It could be a dog who's struggling with other dogs. It could be a dog who struggles with um, trying to chew on wildlife or any number of things. But often we are using muzzle in the context of preventing a potential bite. Um, we sometimes also use muzzles to prevent dogs from eating things that they shouldn't. So these dogs are often totally friendly towards other people and dogs, but uh, they love to do things like ingest socks that then need to be surgically removed. Um, so muzzles sometimes get used for things like that. Um, we can sometimes use muzzles to keep other people from approaching. Um, so for example, I've known a couple of really fearful dogs who are really cute and fluffy and people always wanted to come up. And so the owner decided to muzzle train just as a sort of natural barrier that people would stop before they got to this dog. Um, so sometimes it can be a visual cue for other people to give us a little bit of extra space. Um, and for a lot of us, muzzle training is just in case. Um, my dog has never needed to wear a muzzle for something specific, but it is really nice to have just in case. Um, we oftentimes will acclimate puppies to a muzzle in things like kindergarten class because we want them to be comfortable shoving their face in there if something goes wrong. This often includes things like I just broke my leg and I'm in a lot of pain. So dogs that would not normally bite might be in a position to try and snap at the vet. Um, so it's always a great thing for dogs to know how to do. So there are a lot of potential reasons why we might butt muzzle. It's not an assumption that this is an aggressive dog or a bad dog. Um, there are lots of potential reasons why we might want to wear a muzzle. So I do want to make the point that there are some situations where we do not recommend muzzling. Um, one is to prevent the dog from barking by holding their mouth closed. This is something that poses a pretty major welfare concern for a number of reasons. Um, another is as a green light to move forward with unsafe situations. So for example, you have a dog that you know has aggression towards other dogs and you say, we'll just let them in the dog park with a muzzle on. Um, or I have a dog who perhaps, you know, is not friendly with strangers and is really nervous around strangers, has tried to bite them in the past, and we just let strangers walk into the home. Again, the dog is muzzled. These are not good, good uh, choices for us to put our dogs into, right? So um, a muzzle is not, as we say, a green light to go ahead with situations that are unsafe just because they can't or shouldn't be able to bite through it. 
getting punched by a dog with a muzzle, a muzzle punch is still not pleasant and dogs can still be having all of the not so good feelings, even if they're wearing the muzzle. So it is a safety net, not a go ahead. And then also using muzzles in a context where the dog might become trapped, entangled, or unable to breathe or eat or uh, uh, drink appropriately. So this is one where we're really cautious about uh, using muzzles in the context of things like a dog who's in a crate or in a kennel um, or a situation where the muzzle could get trapped on something or attached to something and get the dog stuck. Um, there are people who use muzzles for very short periods of time and people who use muzzles for longer periods of time. Again, what we wanna make sure is that the dog still has access to the things that they need to be safe and to have a good quality of life. Um, and anything where we think the muzzle is gonna get stuck or it's gonna hold their mouth closed or prevent them from eating or drinking, those are things where we would be looking at that muzzle and whether that's actually a safe fit. So I just wanna put that out there. We're not really gonna talk a whole lot about about this as we go. Um, we're mostly going to be talking about what we do when we are going to use muzzles appropriately, but I do want to add that caveat that a muzzle is not always the right solution and that there are things we need to be thinking about. So there are a lot of different types of muzzles, but a couple that I want folks to know about, everything we talk about today is going to be a basket muzzle. So basket muzzles can be made out of a whole bunch of uh, different uh, materials, but the idea is that they're all going to form some kind of a basket around the dog's face. Um, so the main piece is that the dog cannot bite through them, right? There's something that is preventing teeth from getting to other things, um, but that otherwise there is air getting in the dog is able to move within it. Um, the other main kind of muzzle that we see really frequently is what's called an occlusion muzzle. So like this fabric one below, um, you see them a lot at vet clinics because they're used in an emergency situation, right? To prevent a bite when we don't have a whole lot of time to do anything, but these are generally not safe for longer use. Um, and whenever we talk about training a dog to wear a muzzle, these are not the options that we're going to be looking at. So an occlusion muzzle only works because it is holding the dog's mouth mouth shut, that is how we prevent them from biting. The main problem with that is that if a dog can't open their mouth, they also cannot safely pant. Um, so this dog in this muzzle cannot open its mouth to pant, which is really important for dogs to reduce heat, right? So it's a major part of how they regulate their temperature. It's also a part of how they deal with stress. Um, this dog also cannot easily drink water through this, right? And if they could take treats, that would also mean they could probably bite you. So it wouldn't be all that effective for it. So everything we're going to be looking at tonight is going to be basket muzzles. So I want you to have this awareness that an occlusion muzzle is not necessarily bad right? There's nothing wrong with it. It has a purpose. Again, it is the kind of thing where if your dog is not muzzle trained and we need to safely do something at the vet in case of an emergency, this is an option that might be used, but it's not something that we want on that dog any more than, you know, a few seconds or a couple minutes at the most. Um, so everything we talk about today is going to be a basket muzzle. So just keep that in mind. Baskets can come in lots of different uh, materials, um, but we're really looking for things that allow the dog the ability to move. So muzzle options. There are a bunch of things to think about when we muzzle our dogs. Um, one is that material, which could have a number of different impacts, right? So some of them are more heavy than others. Some of them are more heavy duty. Some of them come in different colors. Um, there are uh, a number of benefits to coming in different materials. Another piece to this is whether something is considered bite proof. And on the internet, you will see many arguments about what the term bite proof means. Um, what I would put out there is that most dogs, when they try to bite someone or try to bite another dog or try to eat something, they're going to give a snap, right? And, and most of the muzzles we talk about today are going to stop that snap. However, there are some dogs that will inflict very severe bites or are very determined to bite. And again, that could be something like, I'm really determined to eat this sock, not necessarily I'm determined to bite this person. And there are certain dogs who, if they're trying hard enough, may be able to break through certain types of muzzles. So we'll be talking about that as we go, that there are certain things that are squishier, made of certain materials that may be easier for a determined dog to bite through. 
again, most of these options are going to be totally sufficient for a dog who may, in, you know, put out a small snap, but there are dogs who are very determined. Um, you can look up pictures of, of dogs who have figured out how to grab their tennis ball, even through a muzzle. Um, so that's something that we will be talking about as we go. So again, what type of muzzle are we looking for? Are we looking for, you know, that, that basket muzzle, or do we need an occlusion muzzle again for no one in this, in this situation, would I be looking at an occlusion muzzle, but they are out there. Um, cost and time are major factors. So do I want to, um, go through and, uh, an extreme situation of like measuring every possible little detail. Do I want something off the rack? Um, am I willing to spend more money? Is this for a long-term thing for my dog? Or is this just a quick thing that I want to have just in case? Um, how much do I care about getting that done? Um, fit concerns. This is also something where, especially if you've got a squishy face dog, if you've got a brachycephalic, you know, one of our Frenchies, our bulldogs, um, finding the fits for them can be really hard. If you've got a bull terrier, finding something for their nose shape can be tougher. Um, there are some dogs that are really easy to buy muzzles for. There are many muzzles that come in sizes that work for them. There are other dogs who, because of their dimensions, are just harder to find a good fit for. So keep that in mind. As we look at muzzles, there is no one right muzzle. Depending on your dog and what you're looking to do with a the muzzle, there are a number of different options that might be helpful. So we're going to talk about brands of muzzles. And so a couple things to put out here. One, obviously I'm not sponsored. There are no brands that are paying me to be included. I am not including every brand. I'm including a lot of the most common ones or the things that I think most folks should know. Um, so the Baskerville is the quintessential muzzle that you have probably seen before. Um, it is super, super prevalent. You see it everywhere. Some of the pros for the Baskerville are that you can buy it today in a pet store or off of Amazon or pretty much anywhere else. It is available everywhere. Um, they are cheap. They're usually about 20 bucks. Um, so it's not something that you have to hopefully save up too much for. It's not something that is a huge financial worry. Um, and it's got lots of big holes for treat delivery. Um, however, the downsides of it, there's only six sizes, so you have limited fit options, especially if you've got a larger dog, you start to run into trouble. If you've got a shorter snout dog, sometimes we can run into trouble. So you see this lovely white German shepherd here. If that were a pity face, that short nose, it might be the right amount of pant room, but that nose is going to be too long. If you've got a Great Dane, the size that Baskerville lists as Great Dane size is not what I would put on a Great Dane. Um so there's limited fit options and it's not bite proof against serious risks, right? So this is a muzzle that again, is going to stop most bites from most dogs. However, it is made of, you know, a, a poly sort of plastic rubber material that is not as tough as a wire or a vinyl or something else, right? Um, the other thing that I have on here is that you have to really watch out for some of the knockoffs. So if you search Baskerville muzzle on Amazon, a lot of the things that come up are not actually Baskervilles. And so you will see on the bottom, these are some examples of things that look somewhat like the Baskerville. Some of them even say things that look like they have that ultra symbol on them that the Baskerville Ultra has or the size six or size one through six on there. Um, so they can be pretty, pretty similar. Um, but as you can see here, there's this squishy. Um, and so I actually have a couple that I wanted to show you. And thanks to Gina from Friends of AAC for loaning me some of the knockoffs. So this is an actual Baskerville Ultra. And you can see I'm squishing it pretty hard and it only squishes a little bit. Um, this one, actually, if you need to shape it a little bit for your dog, say they've got kind of a narrow jowl or maybe they're pretty wide, you can actually boil water, put this in there and reshape it slightly. So that's one nice thing about the Baskervilles is that you can reshape them. In comparison, this is a very similar looking muzzle and it's just squishy, right? So this is not something that I would ever use to try to stop a bite. Um, it is, uh, sold and made to look as identical as possible to the Baskerville, but is a knockoff and uh, is not going to be useful. The one caveat to that is that some folks have used it for things like training because it's so squishy. It's not hard. They've used it to get their dog used to wearing a muzzle. They're just not ever going to use it in a situation where they need it for safety reasons. So just keep that in mind. If you're looking for a Baskerville, make sure you're getting the Baskerville Ultra and not a lookalike with it. 
Again, these are all over the place. I tend to find that a lot of the times what we see um, is actually kind of a size down from um, what we need. So you can see with this shepherdy dog um, that there's plenty of room to pant underneath. What we often see is a dog whose face can kind of fit into it where it functions like an occlusion muzzle and basically holds their mouth closed. That's not what we want from these muzzles, but it's often what the sizing charts seem to recommend. Um, so for example, I often see a lot of our sort of smaller pit bull type dogs, you know, that 45 to 50 pound dog getting put in a size three muzzle when realistically they might actually need to be in a size four or even better a size five, even if it's a little too long for them. So just keep that in mind that this is actually how I would fit this muzzle um, on this uh this uh, white dog is that's the, the fit that I would be looking for probably with the Baskerville. So it's the most common option. It is one that even if folks know that this is not a great fit for their dog, they've got a really smushy dog or a really long nosed dog. Sometimes it's a great one to grab for training until they can get something that's a better long-term fit. Again, if you all have any questions as we go through, feel free to pop them in the chat um, and I can either answer it as we go or later on. So Baskerville, really popular brand. Another one that I will bring up is Trust Your Dog. Um, I love this photo. Um, I can't remember the woman's name, but these are from the Trust Your Dog site. Um, but this is one of my favorite dogs and I actually have a very similar muzzle for my girl because I loved this one so much. So Trust Your Dog or TYDM, Trust Your Dog Muzzle, um, they are a small company that makes custom muzzles. So they do have some things now that are sort of stock or off the rack where you can measure and say, oh, that looks like a pretty good fit for my dog but most of what they do and what they're known for is custom. Um, and they have these two options. So one is the vinyl muzzle, um, which is, you know, sort of a thick vinyl. Um, again, it's going to be very bite proof. Um, you can get them with a treat hole, which is what my dog has, as well as, again, it has all of these holes for them to breathe through. Um, they have tons of colors available, like multitudes of colors, which is one of the reasons why folks like them. Um, so they have the vinyl option and then they have the biothane option. And again, with just the biothane, um, you can get it with this treat spot in the middle there. Um, but to keep in mind, again, if a really determined dog were to try to bite, this biothane is relatively flexible. And so a very determined dog may be able to bite through this. Again, we are not talking about the average dog. For the average dog, this would be just fine. Um, but just keep that in mind in terms of you know, level of risk and level of severity that something like this final muzzle is going to be more bite proof. Um, they do have a lot of stuff on their website with support in measuring things. Um, the, the cons for, for these guys are that, you know, custom fitted muzzles are expensive. Um, most of them are going to start around 150 up to about 180 us. Um, and usually it's going to take a couple months to get them shipped to you because they have to be made, uh, made to order. Um, so, you know, pros and cons, definitely. I'm a huge fan of theirs. Um, they do some great education. They also do have a financial assistance program, um, that is funded by users who donate in so that if someone is really desperately in need of a muzzle, they may be able to support. Um, and again, this is where my girl Nina's muzzle is from. So she has a very similar uh, one of the vinyl muzzles. And again, different colors in there. Um, they have different clips that I like. I like being able to have the clip instead of the um, like the slide buckle. Um, just for me, I find it easier. For some dogs, the clip is really scary. Um, and so depending on the dog, you may prefer one or the other. And I have a top strap for my girl just based on her face that helps keep it safe. Some dogs do not need that top strap. Um, it just kind of depends on your dog's fit, especially if you've got someone like a short face dog, that top strap is really going to keep it stationary. Some longer muzzle dogs, it may not be that necessary. So just some things to know about this one. Um, we have a couple of questions about fit and uh, different materials. So questions about the, the fit, I will um, answer more as we go on that. But when it comes to the, the vinyl and uh, different things in the Texas heat, it's tough. So, um, you know, between the different things, the vinyl is obviously going to, it's going to absorb 
more, more heat into it. This is not necessarily a muzzle that I would take my dog for a 40 minute walk in summer in Texas. Right. Um, so there are definitely pros and cons with some of these things versus some of the wire basket muzzles that are going to let a lot more air through, but they may also be a little bit heavier. So we'll talk about that as we go. Um, so different options, depending on the weather and what you're trying to do there for sure. So this is trust your dog. It's one of our custom muzzle options. And again, the two, the two pieces there. Bumas is another really common one for these uh, biothane muzzles. So similar to what we saw with the trust your dog, again, we're going to see a more expensive muzzle. They do have uh, pre-made ones and then you can get them custom built. Um, they have about 11 sizes. And again, the, the sizing and what they recommend may or may not be the same thing that I would recommend. It just depends on their sizing chart. Um, but it's sort of roughly equating to dog size. Again, you know, not all Rottweilers are the same size, especially if you have somebody like a pit bull type dog. Oh boy, there's a lot of pit bull type dogs that can range from like 40 pounds all the way up to 80 pounds. So you know, take, take the sizing recommendations with a grain of salt. Um, but I do like, they have this little tool on their site where if you're looking for a custom muzzle, um, you can go through a process where they'll try and help you figure out what you need. Um, so that's really helpful. And again, tons and tons of colors. Um, one thing that I would like for folks to take note of again, is this spot. So in our previous one, you saw that this one has like a little uh, a little hole in it. That's our treat hole. Um, in the Bumas that I have here, there is not a treat hole currently. I've had a number of folks recently who had a similar muzzle to this and we're trying to figure out like cutting through part of it to make a treat hole. And it's really, really difficult to do that. So keep in mind, if you're looking at this guy, if this is all you have to cut into, it's really hard to get treats in there. So think about whether you want a treat hole in this muzzle. If you're using it to train your dog to wear a muzzle, in general, we're going to want a treat hole there so that we can shove food in as they learn that muzzles are fun. Um, the only time we don't use a treat hole is really if there's a major safety concern. Um, so just keep that in mind as you're ordering what you're going to need. So again, with the biothane, it's not going to be bite proof to the same level that some other things are going to be. Um, but Bumas is another option for these lovely biothane muzzles that come in lots of fun colors. Jafco is another uh, really common brand. Um, these ones come in kind of three options. So the two that are the white and the black are this poly plastic, and then they have a vinyl one. So the vinyl is similar to the one that we saw with Trust Your Dog. It just doesn't come with all the fancy biothane straps. Um, so the main thing to note about these muzzles, again, super common. Um, they're relatively affordable, right? They range in that $40 to $50 thing, but flex Flexibility is the piece that's really different. So just to show you these, um, the white and the black ones, this is about how much I can squish. The vinyl ones, I can squish a lot more. So if you're looking for, if you have a dog whose face is a particular shape, right, and you're trying to figure out whether it's going to fit them, these ones are going to give a lot more. Um, they're also a lot heavier, right? So the vinyl versus the polyplastic, these guys are going to be lighter muzzles, both the white and the black. Um, so again, for, you know, going out and doing lots of stuff, um, you know, they may be easier. And again, if you live in a place like Texas, getting a black muzzle may not be your best idea. Um, so it just depends a little bit on what you're looking for. Again, everything's going to come with that felt upper part. Most muzzles are going to have something in there. And depending on the fit for your dog, you may actually decide to add additional felt in a particular way that makes it comfy for their nose or cut out a piece of it so that it fits your dog better. Um, but these are going to be your options within the Jaffco's. Um, so they're really, really uh, common. They're very much bite proof, right? These are not easy to bite through. Um, most of them, you do have that option for the treat hole. Um, there's only, only a few sizes, right? There's no custom version of this. And again, the sizing can be a little wonky. Um, so there are things like a 3R versus a 3 where you're going I don't I don't entirely know what the difference between these sizes are so it can start getting a little bit more tricky the other thing is you can't like go to jaffco.com and order a muzzle there um so Leerberg is a very common um place that sells muzzles they will sell a lot of different options on their site um but that's one place so it's not something that you can like go to a store and try on things like that um 
but these guys are really, really common. You know, a lot of our vet behaviorists really like them. Um, they're, they're nice muzzles. And again, they're not custom, but they do have a number of different sizes. So, and then this one, <laughs> these muzzles have many different names because they are sold by many different resellers, even though it's the same underlying products. Um, so I refer to these as Chopo muzzles. You can see um, in Europe, Chopo is one of the brands that they go through, um, but Learberg is a common one. Dean and Tyler is a common one. Um, so these are all sort of the same muzzles. And this is where it starts to get really tricky is that they're sold under different things. They're sizing numbers are super confusing, um, but these can be great options for a number of dogs. So the one that I have here, um, I like because it's kind of a short muzzle. So for some of our pity type dogs, this can be a good option. Um, they come in different widths, heights, and lengths. Um, and that's where some of the sizing trouble comes. You can see this one has the, the front that is across like this, but there are options to say, hey, I actually need this to go down a little bit, or I need to add additional length on here, right? So these ones, they're not too heavy, which is nice. There's lots of open air, right? So if you're in a place where you're worried about things like that vinyl muzzle getting too hot, this might be a good option. And there's like really big holes to be able to feed through, right? Um, so if I'm doing something, for example, where I wanna be tossing treats to a dog and have them be able to take treats up off the ground, if they're in something like this, they may be able to, again, like lick things up off the ground to grab them. If they're in something like this vinyl muzzle, unless I'm putting it directly through that treat hole, they're not going to be able to pick that up, right? Any of our basket muzzles, they should be able to learn how to drink water through. They just kind of have to shove their, their nose in it. Um, some dogs, it takes a little bit for them to get used to it. But when it comes to things like, do I want to be able to feed this dog from my hand versus do I want to potentially feed them on the ground? For example, you know, sometimes with a dog with stranger danger, where we might be working on treat and retreat or treat scatters, something like this muzzle might be a better fit. Um, so again, the biggest, the biggest issue with these guys is finding the right size, getting the right measurement, figuring out where to buy it. Um, again, they come from a lot of different sources. Um, but that is one of my favorite other muzzles. Um, another note for y'all, um, is that muzzle training and tips is where a lot of these photos are going to be coming from. It is a fabulous resource. There are a couple of major resources when it comes to muzzling. One of them is the muzzle up project, which has been around forever and is phenomenal about education around muzzles. Um, muzzle training and tips is really specifically about things like how do I find the right muzzle? So if you're looking for something like a polymer wire, muzzle and you're like, I'm so confused by the different sizing. They have so many resources on their site for it. The one caveat that I'll note is that this is not a positive reinforcement based trainer. This is someone who specifies, uh, uh, specializes in muzzles, you will see prong collars, shock collars, all kinds of things on their site. Um, just know that going in that that is not what we would advocate for. They're a great resource for muzzle sizing. Um, so we'll see lots of photos um, from their site as we go through. Um, Katie asked, uh, so the polymer wire muzzle might not be the best fit for a scavenging dog with pica. Yes, depending on what they scavenge. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but there are also things called stool guards, um, which is a fun thing because lots of dogs like to eat stool or poop. Um, so there are certain muzzles where you can actually buy like a plastic insert that just hits the end of it. So instead of having the whole thing be basketed, um, there's just a spot at the end that has basically no room in it. Um, so like if you look at things like the birdwell muzzles or any of the greyhound muzzles, a lot of them have a stool guard in it. So yes, if you're looking for a dog to not be able to pick up small things, having one of these bigger wire baskets, not your best option, unless you find a specific stool guard to go with it. So again, muzzle training, muzzles different depending on the dog, depending on what we want the dog to not be able to do, depending on the situation that they're going to be in. Okay, and then the muzzle movement, this is a newer one. Um, they launched about a year and a half ago, I believe. And um, some of the benefits are lots of pretty colors. So the actual basket comes in pretty colors. So we've got black and white for the Jaffgoes. We've got the tan and black for 
Baskervilles, but this is the first company that I've seen that is really advertising the baskets come in different colors. Um, they started as a Kickstarter, so they're releasing new sizes as they go. I believe they have five sizes so far. Um, so it they're only about 60 bucks, so they're not as expensive as some of the custom ones. They do come in all of the fun, pretty colors. Um, it should be pretty bite proof. Um, these are made of, again, like a pretty heavy duty uh, polymer. This is not squishy even remotely, which means that, again, if your dog is not quite the right size, they're not going to work for you. But they do come in lots of different um, colors um, and sizes. This is one of the biggest ones for a larger breed dog. Um, if you live in Austin, you may recognize the top dog in the picture. That is Hamilton. He is local to us. Um, and the bottom picture is... Uh, a dog who's with a trainer who I believe lives in Singapore. So all across the world, um, these are really cool muzzles because they're all about making muzzles less stigmatized. Um, but again, limited sizes that are out there right now, more of them are coming soon. Um, if you have a bully breed or any kind of breaky, uh, smushy face dog, they don't currently have anything out, but some of the new sizes are built more for bully breeds. Um, so they're continuing to add things um, as they go. So you may see these ones out there as well. Um, and they have really fun content on social media, again, especially around things like um, reducing stigma for muzzles. So cool stuff to be able to watch. Okay. And so there are a million other kinds, right? So there are long snouted muzzles. There are plastic wire or plastic basket muzzles that I haven't talked about a million other kinds. The main question that comes up a lot is what to do with brachycephalic dogs. Um, so for any of our smushy face dogs, there are limited options. These are two that I get asked about a lot and I have never used them and they make me a little bit nervous. Um, part of it is that when we do muzzle training, we're trying to get a dog used to wearing this weird thing on their face. And if that weird thing is large and covers half of their face, that is often going to be harder to desensitize them to. Um, so I, I have some worries about, you know, the length of the process to get them really happy wearing this thing. Um, the other piece is that with some of the materials, it can be harder to identify something that's going to work for them. Um, these are often the cases where I really like the custom muzzles out of trust your dog or Bumas. Um, because again, they can make something that is fairly shallow that will still fit over this dog's face. Um, but is absolutely a challenge. I have joked recently that dogs should either be allowed to have a smushy face or aggression issues or pica issues, but they shouldn't be allowed to have both because muzzles are really hard. Um, but these are generally not muzzles that I would recommend. I would generally recommend looking for a custom muzzle, especially because within our brachycephalic dogs, there's such a wide difference in how wide their face is, how large they are, how their mouth is shaped. And we have to be so cautious about making sure that our brachy dogs can breathe properly. They already have such a difficult time because of the way that their faces are shaped that I wanna make sure we are not adding any pressure that makes it harder for them to breathe and pant as normally as possible. Um, there's a question about, is the recording gonna be made available? Absolutely, I will get it sent out tomorrow as, as much as I can. Um, whisker fatigue. I don't know if it's been discussed um, with muzzle design. That's a great question. I can do some digging after this um, and see what I can find on that. But absolutely, muzzles are not a perfect science, right? There are some existing things out there that are really popular. That muzzle movement brand is brand new. Um, there are a lot of kind of funky looking muzzles out there, um, like these ones and some of the occlusion muzzles. There are things that you can get that are pretty wild and crazy. Um, but generally, if you cannot find a muzzle that is fitting your dog and you're trying to find other options, um, great plan to either work with one of these muzzle companies that does consultations or work with a skilled trainer in your area who has a lot of muzzle experience to see if we can find something that will fit your dog well. Okay, so, and this is another place where we've talked about, you know, I might know that my dog has a really wonky face shape and I'm gonna need to get a custom muzzle for her, but I might decide to grab a Baskerville, you know, at my nearby pet store or off of Amazon or off of somewhere online, just so that I can start doing muzzle training while I'm waiting for my forever muzzle to arrive. Um, and then this is a picture of a Baskerville where someone has actually cut the front out. And this is where, when I talked about the knockoff Baskervilles, again, I would not use this to try to 
stop a bite, um, but it would be relatively easy to chop off the front part um, and get my dog really acclimated to wearing the muzzle and having it on their face while we do fun things, while we do training, all this other stuff. Um, this was, this kind of made the rounds on the internet. We were all like, oh my gosh, this is so great. After the Muzzle Up project posted this, um, this image a few years ago. Oh gosh, I don't even remember when now. Um, but this is one of the things that you can do if you end up with a cheap muzzle. Also, if you work in an animal shelter or an animal rescue and you get muzzles donated that you think are Baskervilles, check to make sure they're not these guys that have been donated. Um, these again, Austin Animal Center had had them and I requested them since they will not be used for safety purposes there, but we can use them with training. So just another option. Um, again, there are lots of ways to use muzzles as we get through the training process. Okay, so let's talk about fit. So fit is not just for fun sweaters. Um, it is really important with muzzles for a couple of reasons. So your dog should be able to breathe. They should be able to pant comfortably, right? Um, and not just a little bit. They should be able to pant as comfortably as ne they need to in whatever situation they're going to be wearing their muzzle. Um, in most cases for this webinar, they should also be able to drink water and take treats. Again, a lot of what we're going to be talking about for muzzles includes training a dog to wear a muzzle. And we're going to be using food for that. Um, they should not be able to bite. That's that's kind of the point of it. Um, there is a good chance, and I'm telling you this now, there is a good chance that what you think looks well-fitted is actually too small. And I too was this person. Um, so in 2020, um, I posted a photo of uh, the dog that I was fostering wearing a muzzle and was very proud of our muzzle training. And some lovely, well-intentioned fellow trainer said, I think that muzzle looks too small. And I went, I don't know that that's right. I think it's perfectly well-fitted. And I went down a rabbit hole and went, oh, this person was absolutely right. This is way too small. And I just didn't realize it. So again, one of the things that we are often seeing, and it's it's in a lot of the literature that you know the muzzle manufacturers put out, is we will see a dog that's wearing a muzzle and their face is filling the whole muzzle. And so it's functioning essentially like an occlusion muzzle where it's, it's fitting directly over their snout and preventing them from fully opening their mouth. So that is often what looks normal to us. So keep in mind that as we go through some of the things that look pretty big to you, that is actually what we are often looking for. There's such a thing as too big. Let's be clear about that. But the main thing is they should not be able to bite. So we need something that is preventing them from putting teeth on whatever it is we don't want them to put teeth on. But that other than that, we want to make sure that it's large enough for them to be comfortable in. Um, and this can feel really uncomfortable when again, we are used to seeing lots of images of dogs wearing muzzles that are probably too small for them, but we think that that's what's normal. So if you're going, I don't know about this, I was there. It was not just you. Um, so as we go into fitting a muzzle, one thing to keep in mind is that every muzzle manufacturer has their own preferred ways of measuring things. These come from the muzzle movement and they're the prettiest colors and the nicest graphic designs. And that's why I've chosen them to model for you. Um, but in general, most of these things are fairly consistent. Just be sure that if you're measuring your dog for a muzzle, that you go with the way that they want it measured. So if they're looking for something like circumference or height, make sure it's coming from the right spot. But in general, they're going to look for height. And this is a straight up and down from sort of bridge of the nose to bottom of the chin. Um, length is usually starting in front of the eyes. Again, we want muzzles that don't run into the dog's eyes and smush up there. Um, but we're looking for that snout length and then that width, which is cheek to cheek. We want to make sure that that muzzle is not smushing them in or that it's not way out here. So those are just straight measurements in any given direction. Um, I'm also going to play this for you really quickly. Some tool tips to measure Make sure your dog has seen the measuring tape before. Um, you know, you may use some cheese or some other things to get them used to the measuring tape, and you may have to do this over multiple sessions. Um, my dog was not a fan of this weird, funky object that I was bringing towards her, and so it took us a while to get the measurements that we need. Um, and again, erring on the side of being a little too big, usually better off than being a little bit too small. But there are several folks, whether it's the muzzle movement, trust your dog, um, uh, muzzle up project and muzzle training and tips all have ways to help you with, with your measurements. So just really quickly. So you can see again, what, um, what these measurements are meant to do. The first measurement we're going to do is length. You can see here, I'm measuring 1.5 centimeters in front of her eyes to the tip of her nose. 
up between the eyes is starting the measurement too high. It needs to be on the muzzle, just in front of her eyes, for an accurate length measurement. Next is height. We need to be measuring in a straight line from the top of the muzzle to the deepest part of her jowl. This needs to be measured just in front of her eyes. You can see here that Nellie's height is nine centimeters. It's really important that you don't curve the measure around the muzzle or mouth, but keep the tape as straight as possible from the top of the muzzle to the deepest part of the jowl. Finally, we're looking at width. This measurement is the widest part of the dog's cheeks. You can see here the tape measure is too far to the left, so we line it up with the widest part of her left cheek to the widest part of her right cheek. Again, keep the measure straight, not curved over the muzzle. Awesome. So again, these are meant for uh, the muzzle movement muzzles, right? So there are some folks that might ask for, you know, if you're sizing for a Bumos, they might want a slightly different measurement. So make sure you check those. Also make sure you're checking for the measurement of the dog versus the measurement of the inside of the muzzle. If your dog has, you know, a three inch snoot, make sure that when you're looking at sizes, it says, you know, three inch snoot is what you're looking for. Not that there's only three inches of space that would be right up on your dog's nose. Um, so just make sure that you know what you're looking for um, as you start measuring. So fitting a muzzle and ordering um, again, there are a lot of different types of muzzles out here. This is again from muzzle training and tips because they're really passionate about helping people find the right sizes, especially when some of these things like these metal basket muzzles might be listed across different brands and listed as different sizes. Um, so for example, you know, a Baskerville size four, which is sort of a middle sized Baskerville here is a similarly sized Chopo muzzle, um, and some of the, the comparisons across. So if you you cannot get measurements on your dog um, for whatever reason. Maybe your dog is not safe to handle directly, right? And so maybe you'd be risking a bite trying to measure that way. You can certainly take an existing muzzle that you know sort of fits them and try to finagle another muzzle that might work. Um, so we do have some options there. And there are some places that will give sizing charts. Again, if you're like, I'm really trying to find the right fit and I'm struggling to find the right thing, um, Muzzle Training and Tips does have these comparison charts um, that they have on their website as well. Um, but in general, it is not always a sure science to say like, oh, my dog wears a size five, what size should he wear in Learburg? That that's not a that's not a thing that often goes well, right? There are some pieces that we can take from that. But again, we stuff a lot of different kinds of dogs into a Baskerville five. And so knowing that that sort of fits them doesn't necessarily tell us what they do need. So muzzle fit, um, we are going to talk about some muzzles that fit really nicely and some muzzles that maybe don't fit really nicely. Um, I love this photo of the Husky because you can see that he's doing the exact same thing without the muzzle as with the muzzle, right? So this dog doesn't have a super deep pant, but you can see this muzzle gives a little bit of space in front of the nose and there's a little bit of space under the pant and the dog is able to pant normally with their normal behavior, right? Um, for this dog who has a very different shaped face, right? It comes up a little bit to avoid his nose. Again, just a little bit, like a half an inch in front of the nose, and then he's able to pant. Um, you can see the vinyl muzzle on this pity. That's kind of a funny, uh, a funny perspective on him, but there's lots of this room down below for our pity to be able to pant. Um, we see the black Jaffco on our little lab friend, um, and again, lots of, lots of room there. And then again, these guys, you can see the bottom part. The idea is that that dog should be able to fully open their mouth comfortably without issues. Um, again, a little bit of room in front, but not a whole lot. None of these dogs have it pushing up into their eyeballs, right? This one, you can see they've even sort of done the cutout, that little half moon, um, to avoid pushing up into this dog's eyes. Um, so these are some well-fitted muzzles. And then we have some not so well fitted muzzles. And again, these are coming from muzzle training and tips. So thanks to, you know, all of the many people who submitted photos of their dogs to help other people learn. Um, so this one, this dog cannot open its mouth. Um, and it's also, there's a lot of space in front of its nose. So if he were to, you know, put his face on the ground to sniff at something that would shove up into his face. Um, this one is just pretty small. Again, it's functioning sort of like that occlusion muzzle where it's just 
keeping its mouth closed. Um, this one, again, you can see our, our boxer friend can sort of open its mouth, but not really. And you can see how smooshy it is on the cheeks there. Um, again, another dog who clearly cannot really open its mouth there. Um, and then this is a, an example of the, it is too big, right? The length is actually pretty nice, um, but there is too much extra room here. This is going to pop into this dog's neck. It's not going to be comfortable. Um, so these are the kinds of things where, you know, having, having a trainer look at it is a good idea, but again, many of us did not get great education around muzzles. Um, so many of us are having to retrain it, but going through some of these sites, taking a look at some things, um, as you look at muzzle sizing for your dog is a really good idea. Okay. So muzzle training, I love muzzle training and I'm going to go through all of this pretty quickly. Um, it is very easy to get overwhelmed or stuck in muzzle training for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that a lot of the videos give you the first part and the end part, and then you get to the middle and you're like, what do I do here? Um, another is that we often, we try to go too fast and we get stuck. So today we're going to cover it in eight steps. And again, the reason I'm breaking it down this way is because I find that most people get stuck at several points in the middle and can't figure out how to move forward. So we are specifically going to go through some of those things. So pro tips for muzzle training, go slow to go fast. Um, you do not win extra points for going as close to your dog's edge as possible. You want this to become really comfortable. So it develops a deep habit. Work toward a final goal. So whenever you're doing your muzzle training, if you look at yourself and you go, I'm holding this muzzle in a way that like I would never hold it to actually put the muzzle on them or in a situation where I'm like, it would be hard to actually move to the next step from here. We want to think about how we're training to make it easier on ourselves and then make peace with errors. So coming back to point one, go slow to go fast. Um, if you go too fast, your dog will decide they do not like the muzzle. Um, and this is a place where, I, as a professional dog trainer, have multiple times had this happen to me because we are humans, we get impatient, we get excited, we make mistakes. And so just make peace with the fact that you may make these mistakes, you likely will at least once and have to kind of take a step back with your muzzle training. All right, so with that said, we're gonna talk through these eight steps and we're gonna go super lightning fast through several of them, especially because you can find information about them everywhere. So one quick note, People are different and our bodies are different. So I'm going to make some recommendations like I recommend using your knees to hold the muzzle when you do muzzle training, or you'll see videos where it's like, we recommend leaning down and holding the muzzle next to the ground. Um, these may not work for you and your body for a variety of different reasons. So do not feel like that is the only way. There are lots of modifications that we can make. And if you're struggling to figure out how to make this work for your dog and for your body and your needs, we can figure that out. So training part one is exposing your dog to the muzzle. And this is out there in a lot of different formats. Um, so the wonderful Chirag Patel um, has an example of this where he is basically um, taking out the muzzle and then giving the dog treats. It's important to use treats at this stage of training that your dog enjoys a lot. So the muzzle comes out, the treat goes out. The muzzle goes away, the treats stop. Note the order in which I present the muzzle and the food. The muzzle is always shown to spook first, followed by the food. This is important because we would like spook to make an association with the muzzle that only once the muzzle appears does nice things happen. Okay, so in the beginning, we are just saying muzzle appears and treats appear. And this is where we're going to have a, uh, oh, I'll do this one first. Another example of that one um at 345 um so you will see again um and this is from the muzzle up project we are putting the muzzle down and getting treats so i'm holding the straps on the side because i want him to be comfortable i don't want him to think that just because i start holding the straps that he's going the straps that he's going to be forced into something scary so we're putting out the the muzzle and then putting out treats so this is where we take a a very quick break into training lingo. Um, so what we're talking about is classical conditioning here. So when we start our muzzle training, we are saying we are gonna develop a 
pure association between the muzzle and treat. So if you've heard about Pavlov ringing the bell, the idea was that Pavlov would ring the bell, feed the dogs, ring the bell, feed the dogs. At some point when the dogs heard the bell, they would start salivating because they were excited for the food coming. So what we're doing is we're pairing something new, the muzzle, with something that your dog already has a positive response to, which is really good food. So now we want the new thing to take on the value of that food. So we're not asking for a behavior. We're not reinforcing anything. There's no positive reinforcement happening. We are just saying muzzles equal food. And so what we're looking for is what we call a conditioned emotional response, which is that your dog should get excited when the muzzle comes out. So that's how you know that this phase is working. So I usually recommend doing this, you know, a couple minutes and then you pull the muzzle away and then you do it a couple minutes, you pull the muzzle away. At some point after you've done, you know, 20 or 30 repetitions of this, the second the muzzle is presented, your dog should start going crazy. So when you think about your dog's reaction, if you open up a snack wrapper and they get all excited and they wag their tails and they come over and they're super happy, that's the kind of thing that we're looking for them to show when they see the muzzle. That is how you know that you are succeeding at this first step which is just exposing them to the muzzle. And there's tons of resources on this online. We can send you videos. This is a place that we see a lot. So part two is getting your dog to put your put their face into the muzzle. Oh, it looks like, let's see if this one will pull up. Um, so at this one, you are just... Da -da. Hey, no English. We are just seeing if the dog will start putting their face in there while you're holding a treat in the muzzle. And I'm gonna remove it right so we are trying to coax them into doing a thing so that we can train for it later, but they're just coming to get the treat through it. Just feeding her treats right through the muzzle and immediately- And so in this one, there's a little bit of putting the, the muzzle at the dog, but ideally we want them to actually put their own face into the muzzle. But we're not doing any anything for very long. They're just eating straight out of it. And at some point, you can also just feed through the muzzle while they continue to eat. Um, so here's another example. Um, if it will load. And don't forget those favorite treats. When you start your basket muzzle training, you're going to want to have a large variety of high value treats for your dog. It can be tricky getting the treats into the muzzle. So a couple options might be spray cheese canned dog food. You can use a pretzel rod to put spray cheese on it. Sometimes you can use the dog's regular kibble. You can also cut up string cheese or hot dogs in thin strips or freeze dried turkey or chicken, something that's really yummy that your dog likes and it's easy for them to eat and fairly easy for you to put through the basket muzzle as well. So that is Debbie Martin, who is local to Austin. She is fabulous um, and works with Fear Free. Um, so you can see she is feeding directly through the muzzle. She's not asking the dog to do anything. It's just food is in here. So you're building some duration of the dog keeping their face in there. Um, one note is that she is holding the basket muzzle with her hand. Um, you will see some places where they will put the muzzle onto the ground to have the dog first explore and get used to it. I prefer to do muzzle training with the muzzle between my knees. And I'll show that a little bit later. So just keep in mind for your body, for your dog, for your situation, the positioning you use might be different. So one other example um, from Mike Shikashio, let's see. He likes to do this by using the box itself for something like a Baskerville. Um, So you can see in all of these cases, we're just using different ways to get the dog used to having their face in the muzzle and having that be a pleasant experience where they're eating. So a quick break. The next things we're going to talk about fall into positive reinforcement. So at this place, this is where I start liking to add an actual behavior where I'm asking the dog to do something and then I'm rewarding for it. So in the positive reinforcement world, all that means is the dog does something, they get a treat for it, and they decide that it's worth it to do that thing again. Um, if you're familiar with marker training or clicker training, I will often use yes as opposed to a clicker 
because I find it easier in this context to not have an additional clicker in my hand. Um, but what we're going to do from here, again, a lot of folks will continue to say, like, start doing straps, start doing other things. For me, it's easier to start doing actual training, operant conditioning um, at this point. Pro tips, give your dog a second. Um and you can draw attention to the muzzle without putting food in it. So my goal is that my dog will put their face into the muzzle, even if there's no food already in it. So we've been sort of luring them in because there's been snacks and now we need them to get ready to put their face just into the muzzle. So this is one of my favorite ways to do it is by using your knees. So you can see she's kind of moving the muzzle and puts his face in. I like using the knees again because it tends to be face height for some dogs and it's hands free. So at this point, she's still feeding in the muzzle, but she's getting him used to that positioning. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is really where I start that part three of how do I get their face in the muzzle if there's no food already in it? And so in this one, she is using a clicker. Again, I tend to use a verbal marker, but in this one, you can see she's she hasn't gotten food, but as soon as the dog puts its face in, then she's gonna click and then feed. So in this one, the dog is learning that I shove my face in and good things will happen, but it's not necessarily that the treat is in the muzzle. It is that shoving my face in the muzzle is of itself a good behavior. And this is really helpful because at some point I need to not have to hold the food in the muzzle the whole time that I'm trying to put their muzzle on. Again, I don't have enough hands for that. So that's that part three is getting their face in the muzzle without food in there. Part four for me is building that duration. Um, so this is really where we are getting the dog used to holding their face. So again, you can see that, that knee idea. And this time, all we're going to do is wait for just a split second before we mark and reward. But we're just getting them used to holding their face in. So the dog previously would just shove it and remove it. Now we're waiting for them to shove their face in and hold it for a second so that we can then move from there. And again, I know I'm going through these super quickly. Um, these are all linked in here and I can get you access to these videos as well. Okay, so part five, all the straps. So this is the part where people usually panic, where they're like, yeah, my dog will hold their face in the muzzle and eat food out of the muzzle, but what do I do with the straps? Um, so here's one example, again, from Chirag Patel. Um, let's see where he has it. On to the next stage. Dun, dun, dun. What we will now do is put food into the muzzle and cup it in our so he will often start um holding the straps they're not actually latched right now this muzzle just keeps them that way but he can start actually messing around with the straps with his other hand right so sometimes people will do it while holding it and again feeding through that they can start messing with the straps touching the neck straps behind the dog's head so he's not clipping it he's just doing a little bit of a wiggle the first few times just get the dog used to the feeling of your hands moving around their head and the dog is still the eating off of the front the of muzzle. the muzzle that's why he's kind of moving his head around is to get uh get the spray cheese off so again we are uh looking at the straps and clipping or buckling and i'm going to show you this video it goes through a bunch of pieces of it um this is my girl when i lived in a one-bedroom apartment and separated my kitchen so you didn't have to look at it but you can see she's shoving her face in at this point but not necessarily holding it now she's holding it and I'm moving the strap around. This is, she has done many, many iterations of this. So this is just us warming back up to the spot where she was, where I might even touch the clips together. So I'm working the different straps on her, getting used to it moving around her ears and me fiddling with it, right? Making all these kind of funny sounds. And this way, again, I'm not having to hold it because it's between my knees. And that way I can use both of my hands to do this. So again, not our first session. We've done dozens of sessions at this point. This is just us warming back up to that. And you can see in here, she's going to pull away, right? And so what I'm going to do there is take a way big step back and just make it really easy and reward for that. So I'm able to clip. Lots of treats. And again, this muzzle would have looked enormous to me three years ago. Um, but again, this is the right length for her. You can see when her snoot goes in, it's almost at the end and it gives her lots of room to 
panting. So again, a same session where, you know, I'm fiddling with her ears and we've worked a lot on just that before we get up to this place, right? So getting her really comfortable holding her head in so that I can easily clip the strips. Also, just like, look how cute she is. She's delightful, shoving her face in there at high speeds because she lost that muzzle because we've done all of this training. So we have this clipping or buckling and unbuckling the clasp. Um, and it depends on what kind of clasp you have. Um, and then wearing the muzzle for short bursts. So in that one, I was pretty immediately unclipping it once it was on her. Um, the next step would be for us to put the muzzle on and have them wear it just for a short period of time. We can make the muzzle happy by having it only worn for really short sessions. And as they're comfortable, we can start to elongate the time that they wear the muzzle. At the very start, it might just be having the muzzle on for a few seconds, lots of treats, and then we take it off. And later we can start to build up on that duration. So this part is really important because what often happens is the dog has been comfortable with putting the muzzle on, but then suddenly it's attached to them and then we expect them to wear it consistently. And that does not often go well. So putting it on for a couple seconds, taking it off a couple seconds, doing some treats, you know, maybe ask them to do a sit, something like that. That's really easy for them, maybe a paw, and then you take it off. So we're wearing it for short bursts. And then the last stage is wearing the muzzle for a longer period of time. So anytime wearing the muzzle is filled with fun, we want our dog to remember that muzzle equals yay, yummy, good stuff, fun thing. So this could mean going for a walk. This could be, um, you know, playing. It could be offering some fun skills that they like. Just keep in mind, if the muzzle going on predicts bad things, the dog will start avoiding the muzzle. So if the muzzle only goes on before a vet visit, if the muzzle only goes on before a bath or before nail trims or something that they don't like, they're going to avoid that muzzle. Um, so there are a lot of options. This is a uh, local dog giving um with her mom a quick fix on instagram um and giddy is wearing her i can't remember if it's boomas or trust um but having a great time so again these are the kinds of things that you want to practice with your dog um so that you don't just put the muzzle on when you need it when things require it to be safe so we want to do lots of fun stuff once that muzzle is on so again, to recap, we start with getting the dog used to the muzzle being there and that it means fun stuff and getting them used to putting their face in to eat good stuff. Thank you, Nikki. Giddies is trust your dog. Um, uh, trust your dog muzzle is for that dog in the, in the video. Um, so we start with getting them used to putting their face in the muzzle. And then at some point we teach them, okay, shove your face in and then I will give you a treat. Shove your face in, then I will give you a treat. Hold your face in. Now hold your face in while I start to move some straps. Hold your face in while I start to clip and unclip the straps. Hold your face in while I clip them. And then yay, a couple seconds, yay, treat, 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 and then off. And then eventually we get to this point where they can wear it for a couple minutes or even for longer while we go do fun things. Again, making sure that we don't ruin all of the hard work we just put in by having them wear it for scary things before they're ready um, or always making sure that it predicts scary things. So that is why I've split it into eight parts. I know I went through that lightning fast. Again, I can make sure you get all of the videos in there and particularly the one that I showed um, of training with my girl. Again, even though it is probably the worst quality video that we have, um, it does show all of those steps that I find are the toughest for folks of moving those straps around and practicing that clipping. That is often where folks seem to get stuck. Uh -huh. Okay, so muzzle stigma. Um, this is my other dog, Bones. Um, I have a lot of skeleton dogs, um, and it turns out that Bones, while he is larger than my dog, Nina, fits pretty perfectly into her trust your dog muzzle. Um, so this makes me very happy because I love Halloween. Um, so there are a lot of folks out there who are nervous about muzzles. They're nervous that someone will judge their dog or them for their dog wearing a muzzle. And there are certainly people out there who will look at your dog strangely if they're wearing a muzzle. Um, so there are a couple of things. One of them is that you can decorate. 
Um, again, you can, there are lots of colorful muzzles out there now. Um, and this is an old Baskerville that I have where I used um, fun colored duct tape to make it pretty colors. Um, again, there are other ways that you can make your muzzle fun and exciting. Um, and that can sometimes be really helpful for dealing with some of that stigma. Um, someone actually, and I can't remember who started this, calling them party hats, um, where my dog's just wearing their party hat, which again, kind of reframes some of that. Um, sometimes we might say things like her muzzle makes her feel safer. Um, you know, her muzzle, again, we know that the muzzle does not inherently make the dog feel safer, but we can use the muzzle to help manage situations safely. Right. Um, so sometimes, especially if you're talking to, you know, a small child who says something because they see your dog with a muzzle, that can be helpful language. And then always we're practicing our training. So there is muzzle stigma out there. I think one of the best things we can honestly do is talk about muzzles for dogs who don't need them immediately, especially not for a safety risk. My dog loves people all too much, very thoroughly. And we talk a lot about using her muzzle um, because it's important for us to learn that muzzle dogs are good dogs. It's not just for dogs who are bad. Um, the other piece to keep in mind is that regardless of the stigma, safety is important. And so if you have a dog who is potentially a bite risk or who is potentially going to eat something and then need surgery, that safety is worth more than the stigma that may come with it. And so that's a place where if you're feeling uncomfortable, like we can absolutely help with some of that. But at some point, it's also a matter where we go, okay, if some people are going to weird about be weird about it or think it's strange, that doesn't matter as long as my dog is safe, the people are safe, that our environment is safe for them. But just know that it is a thing. It is changing a lot. And some of these organizations do a really great job, whether it's muzzle up project, whether it's muzzle training and tips, whether it's the muzzle movement, um, some fabulous accounts on Instagram, even ones like a quick fix with the dog giddy that I showed before. There are a lot of folks out there that are really trying to change the stigma around muzzles. If your dog needs to wear a muzzle for a certain thing or for a lot of things, that is totally okay. Sometimes that's what we need in order for everyone to be safe. Um, decorating again, here are some really fun ones that I saw. It is kind of a pain in the butt. It is not for the faint of heart. It is a project, um, which is where I'm really glad to see some of these options that are brightly colored, um, so that you don't have to do it yourself. Um, but those are options. Okay. And then troubleshooting. Um, and again, that's one of the lovely trust your dog muzzles. Um, one common thing I've been muzzle training, but I have an emergency and may need my dog to wear a muzzle now. Um, so you saw me training my dog to wear a muzzle that's almost identical to this one. Um, but while we were still in training, um, she had to go to the vet and have what I thought was potentially a mammary tumor examined because she'd previously had one. Um, and she, did not want anyone poking near her and was very nervous. We hadn't had an ability to pre-medicate her. Um, and so what I did was instead of using this muzzle where I was in training for it, I used a Baskerville because I was like, this is not her long-term muzzle. I would much rather her remember that this was the thing that happened during the scary day when everybody poked and prodded at her versus breaking the training that I was doing with this brand new muzzle. So if you have to, uh, deal with a situation where you need to muzzle your dog in an emergency, you may choose to use something that is different so that the dog doesn't uh, interrupt the training process as much. There may be a situation where you're like, it's not perfect, but at least it's close. And just know that, hey, I'm going to break this and I'm going to need to start over. Just know that that's always a risk. If we do something to our dog that is really scary when they're wearing their muzzle, especially as they're part of their training and it's new, there's a good chance we're going to have to backtrack a bunch. Another one, my dog hates their existing muzzle and won't go near it. Um, so shelters have a lot of Baskervilles on hand. I recently had a shelter dog come to a class. Um, we were doing some muzzle practice and the person said, hey, I can't even get near her with the muzzle. She had a bad experience with it at one point. She won't go anywhere near it. And I said, have you seen one of these guys? And so they brought out the, the muzzle movement muzzle, which looks very different. And the dog was able to start essentially from scratch, right? And so that's not going to hold true for every dog. But if your dog has had an issue with a particular muzzle in the past, you may be better off starting with something new and training that up versus dealing with something that already has a negative association. My dog eats poop through the muzzle. This is where we talked about stool guards or potentially a different type of muzzle. 
um, especially for the dogs that are like regularly eating things that they shouldn't, or they're eating a lot of poop and then guarding it. Or um, the dog that I worked with that ate a lot of cicadas and there's the year of the like 17 year cicadas and he was just making himself throw up all the time. That's where having a muzzle that they just can't eat anything through can be really helpful. Um, and then my dog can't easily take treats in their muzzle. This might be a treat delivery thing. So maybe we get something like easy cheese or a squeeze tube or something else that we can kind of shove through the hole easily, or it might be time to swap from a muzzle like this one into like maybe one of our uh, wire baskets that has the bigger holes so that it's easier to put treats into it. So just keep in mind, there might be a couple of solutions if we're having trouble there. And a reminder for this, again, we talked about this before, but it's really important. Muzzles are a safety net, but not an excuse to put your dog into unsafe situations. Dogs can still be terrified in a muzzle. It does not fix the situation. So please do not muzzle your dog and then put them in the same situation where they would ordinarily bite. Bites tend to be a response to stimuli that are too overwhelming, too scary. The dog feels like they need to protect themselves. And so putting them in situations where they're really terrified but you just know they can't bite is not kind to our dogs. So we want to make sure that we are still doing all the other work. This is just an added safety precaution for the situations that we either can't control or we need an additional layer of safety. So tonight we covered why do we muzzle a bunch of different reasons, right? Not just bad dogs. Um, there are dogs that for a variety of reasons, we don't want to be able to eat or chew or bite on things. There are different types of muzzles. And again, our occlusion muzzles that hold mouths closed are not generally what we recommend for overall muzzle usage for dogs. We went through some of the common brands. And again, there are a ton more. Um, and if you're looking for different options, you know, reach out to us. We can get you some resources. Um, we talked about fitting muzzles as well as some good or poor fitting um, that we should be looking out for with muzzles and some of the things around how to measure a muzzle appropriately so that we can get our dog the right muzzle. Um, we talked through the training process. And again, I know I went lightning speed through that, but it's figuring out that middle part, especially of how do I go from my dog will go to the muzzle to my dog will hold their muzzle, hold their face in the muzzle while I clip those straps. That's often where folks get confused or when we get stuck in the training process. We talked a little bit about the stigma and then we talked about troubleshooting some things in our muzzle training process. So we've covered a lot of different things tonight. Um, so with that, let's talk about any questions you have. I know there was one earlier. Um, so let's see. Um, how does the one with the fabric, fabric straps keep from pushing up into the eyes? I returned a Baskerville Ultra that may have been the right size because I was worried about him bumping it into his eyes. Okay. So um, a big piece of this is about the fit of the muzzle on the rest of your dog's face. Um, mm -hmm. So if you think about, if I have one of these, and this is not as far as I can tell, like not one of the main brands, this is not probably a muzzle that I would actually use, which is part of why it was donated to us. Um, but part of the thing here is if it's fitting on my face, I can't really push it up into my eyes. And that's just because of where the bridge of my nose hits it, right? So a lot of the times what we're really looking for, or say with the Baskerville, we might be looking at the width of the cheeks being the thing that prevents it from sliding up. Um, so that's where it's really important that we get a muzzle that is fitting around the face the right way so that it's not going to continue to move up into their eyes. Um, some of that depends on the size or the shape of your dog's face. So we may have less issues with a longer snooted dog versus with some of our breaky or our smushy face dogs. It's harder to get something that's going to really rest and stay on the chin versus sliding up. Um, but a lot of it really, if you're having issues with it going up into the eyes, it may be that the muzzle is too long. It may also be that it's not fitting the rest of their face enough to hold it in place. Um, so that's one of the things that I would be looking at. Um, again, we talked a little bit about different options to deal with the heat or like if we're going to be doing a lot of exercise, that might, um, that might be an issue. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to let me know here. Otherwise, just some quick reminders. 
Um, Every Dog Austin is a 501c3 nonprofit. I can't believe I didn't mention that in the beginning. Um, so all of our webinars are for free. Folks are welcome to donate for those, but we do offer financial assistance on training programs here in Austin, um, as well as a really cool BIPOC speaker series coming up. So our next webinar um, is Ariana Carter. I believe that's our next one and talking about holiday tips. So things we should be thinking about before holiday season um, with our dogs and with dog training. Um, if you are uh, in the mood to make a donation, we would greatly appreciate that. If you want to support us, you can also buy a t-shirt. We have some really fun swag on our website um, that helps rep dog training and the importance of dog training being for everyone. Um, again, this will, is being recorded and I will send out the recording hopefully tomorrow, as long as YouTube cooperates with me. Um, and we hope to see you next time. If you have any questions, feel free to get in touch with me anytime and I will see you all soon. Um, thank you so much for being out here. I really appreciate it and have a good night. Bye.